say I'm Andy, and this is my, my colleague Michaela. We work for the, the, the Government Digital Service, which is a, a part of the Cabinet Office in the UK Government, and it was set up in 2012 by um, Martha Lane Fox was asked to write a report to Francis Maud, who at the, at the time was the Minister for the Cabinet Office, and he, he said to her, so if, you know, if we were thinking about how to make government digital for the 21st century, what, what, what would you do? And she, she went away and she wrote a report and she brought it back to him and you might not expect it from, for, for, from a government report, but he basically said, so, okay, go, go, go and do that now. And um, as a result, Government Digital Service was formed, which set about transforming GovUK website, making that accessible, making that understandable, putting and starting to put um, guidance on there, starting to put services on there, so you can kind of go and renew your car tax on there digitally now. And Government Digital Services has traditionally been building all of those services. Then about 18 months ago, we, we, we'd, we'd done a bunch of exemplars in government about all these different services. And we've, what we were finding was that as, as people were transforming services, they were coming up against the same problems. So how do you collect payments from citizens? How do you send emails to citizens? How do you send text messages to citizens? How do you host your, how, how do you host your service? Like how do you get machines and computers to host your service on? How do you get data for your service? And so a program called Government as a Platform was set up of which um, myself and Michaela are a part. And, and so we're doing, we're doing the data part. And, and the idea is that if you're setting up a service and you need to know a list of, um, a list of countries in the world, then where, where do you get that list from? And normally the answer is, as a, as a domain expert in, I don't know, imports and exports, you go and look on Wikipedia for the list of countries in the world, and you put it into your service, and you hope that it's right. And then when the list of countries changes, hopefully you find out about it and put that into your service as well. And everyone around government was doing this. Some people were publishing their lists on government, and we looked on the GovUK website, and there were like 85 different lists of countries, um, one of which, as far as I can tell, was just a list of um, top-level domain names on the internet. There, there's a document published on the GovUK website which says .arpa is a country, and the name of the country is Old Style ARPANET. <laughs> so next time I visit the US, I'm going to tell them that's where I come from and see what happens. Um, anyway, so Paul Downey, who is one of the founders of OSHUG, which um, we, we jointly r run this meetup with monthly, he started a project called Registers. And, and the idea of Registers was to publish open data that government already hold. So, like I've said, I've said a list of countries. It's the most boring one, but we keep coming back to it because it's the first one we did and we're still very proud of it. Um, but, so, so, so is it all, the, all the data that we're publishing is open data. It's freely available. We're publishing it under the open government license. But the idea is to embed trust in that and some authenticity and, and like link up the technical side of publishing that data with the kind of the process side of how that data comes to be. And so we embedded quite a lot of, lot of cryptography in this open data to do that. And so re registers are these authoritative lists of data that, that you can trust. And um, Paul Downey basically um, came up with this. He did the discovery on this, worked out how it was. And then my colleague Michaela has, has built the whole thing. Um, and what he came up with was this list of kind of characteristics of a register, kind of the defining principles of when you want to do a list of government data, how do you do it? What kind of things does it have to have? How do you make sure it's got this authority? How do you make sure it's got this trust? And I keep mentioning countries, but other, other things, we, we got a lot of um, press before for putting cows on the blockchain. Um, because one of the things, well, one of these lists um, is people who sell, sell ear tags for cows. So, so there's, a, there's a bit of legislation that I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this. Um, so the idea is that instead of having all these hundreds of lists of countries on, on, on the government website, there's, there's one list of countries, it's the, and it's, it's the canonical list. So if you've, got, if you've got a list of countries, if you want a list of countries, you go to that list. If you want a list of cows, you go to the cows list. Um, they're minimum, they're minimum viable. So if, again, if you go and look at the um, Department for Education, they've got a list of schools. And for each school, they've got about 80 columns of data, like the name of the school, like a load of, um, a load of statistical data about the different numbers of boys and girls in different year groups. And 
there's no one part of government that really kind of deals with all of that data. The Department for Education deals with the schools, the Office of National Statistics de de deals with the derivative data. So the idea is we'll make them as thin as possible so that they tell a story about one specific thing. And then if they need to reference something, um, something else, like maybe a school is in a local authority, it needs to reference the local authority it's in, then you just, you just link, to, link to the list of local authorities. You don't duplicate the data. Um, so they have a clear reason to exist. So this is where I get back to my cows example. So there's, there's a, like agriculture is quite, quite a big industry in, in the UK. Quite a large part of the, the Gov UK website is actually devoted to agricultural things. There's a piece of legislation. If, if you go and um, Google in legislation.gov.uk, you'll find tens of thousands of places in statutes of the United Kingdom that say the Secretary of State for such and such shall keep a register of things. So one of the things is a Secretary of State is required to keep a list of vendors for ear tags for cows. So when cows are moving around the UK, you need to be able to identify which cow has been where. And the way you do that is by putting an ear tag on it. And there's a list of people who are, meet the kind of the quality guidelines for, for issuing these ear tags. And that's used to control things like the spread of animal diseases and this kind of thing. So you, you, you work out why you need your list. They're live lists. So again, if you go to the GovUK and find all the current lists, there's PDFs. And they're very difficult to use. You can't read them in your service. You can't do a machine readable version of that PDF. And then if it changes, well, you've got to get get a new PDF and you, you don't know how often that's going to happen. So they're live because we keep them up to date and you can get the changes and they're usable because they have machine readable APIs attached to them. So they use, they use standard names. So this is all about ontology, I guess. And we, we've drawn a lot of, or Paul has drawn a lot of principles from things like the semantic web and things like relational databases and things like graph databases in order to, to put these characteristics, characteristics together. And one of, the, one of these ideas is that if you see something in one register and it's got the same name as something in another register then it's then it's the same thing so everywhere you see a country you know that that's the thing you can go and look up in the country code in the country code register everywhere you see a local authority you know you can go and find more information about that in the local authority register and you can prove integrity so the idea behind this is that there's a process that's gone on there so if you're um, if you're a vendor who wants to wants to issue these cow tags, you want to set up a business to build these tags for cows, you can, um, you can understand what the process is. To, to, like you can go on the website, you can find out what the, legi what, what, the, what the rules are for becoming an approved vendor, and then you know that all the people that have, appear on that list have been through that process to a certain degree. And so um, if someone's gone on that list and then been taken off that list, you can see that. And if, um, so in the example where you make a business decision based on, on that. Maybe you buy one of those, those ear tags, and then that vendor comes into distribute and, and goes off of the list. If you're challenged saying, oh, you bought, an, you bought a, a, an ear tag from an approved vendor, you can actually go back and you can see that that vendor, at the point where you bought them, was on the list and, and you actually acted properly. So it's very important that you can't, um, like even the government like, can't kind of change the history of what the, what the process was in the past. So we can kind of give you trust in in the fact that the process is followed and you can verify that. And then this idea that not all data is open. So if you go and look at something like the land registry, they've got land records going back for several hundred years about who owns which bit of land and what they paid for it and what they did. And um, this is just quite a stark example, but every, basically every single data set we found has slight infestation with personal data. So if you go and look at the land registry record, it's ostensibly open, and, but it's very difficult to get access to because you can't just make an API call or look it up on the web. You've got to send off an um, application to the land registry and ask for it, and they charge you an administrative fee because it costs them money to do that. So if you want to find out something because you're buying a house, it's quite low. You can just pay the, the few pounds that it costs you, and you find out the information. But if you want to do it for all of the plots of land in the UK, then there's kind of a, a process barrier there where you're going to have to spend a lot of time and money to do that. If we publish these lists with machine-readable API, suddenly it becomes very easy to download the entire list and then make a reverse index of all the richest people who own all the biggest plots of land in the UK and then mount phishing attacks against them. So maybe you send them, send them a very specific email like, hello, um, 
Mr. So-and-so, we know you own this piece of land, it's time to renew your, your tax, come to this website, type in your Google password and you can renew it. And, then, and so you can mount these very specific attacks. And so they're infested with these little bits of personal data that you don't necessarily want people to, to get access to. So we kind of recognize that there's kind of this spectrum of openness and everything's hard apart from the really open stuff. So we'll start with the open stuff. I'm actually involved in another, in another project at the moment about the, the more private data. Um, and eighth, they, they contain just, just the facts. So if you've got a list of schools, it's just a list of schools. If, you've got, um, if you want to know some derived data, like the, the statistical makeup of boys and girls in different year groups, then you have to calculate that yourself for your own specific needs from, from other data. It's just the kind of the facts that come out of, a, out of the end of a process of, of registering something in government. And they have a custodian. And, and, and this is one of, the, one of the key points, is that we've got a list of data, we've got a government process, there's legislation involved, there's kind of lots and lots of things working together to make a thing happen, and it's kind of quite difficult to work out who's responsible. And so when we find a list, we find a single named person who is, who is the custodian, whose job it is, is to make decisions about that list. And so, for example, they have to be quite, quite a broad person. So, for example, we, find, we found a guy for the country's register called Tony Warren. He sits in the Foreign Office. He sits in the Foreign Office deciding when the UK recognises a company. He sits on the ISO committee, which decides what the two-letter codes are for, company, uh, for countries. He sits on the permanent committee for geographical naming. And he has operational um, power to decide in the department, and he has input into the legislation and the process to actually that backs up that that process. So he can, he can actually be responsible for. Okay, so this set of things is something that we can actually decide on, and if we can't decide on it, then we know how to get it changed. And in other departments, that's been much more difficult to find. Some some other departments are a lot more hierarchical. You've got a lot of people making operational decisions that don't necessarily have policy responsibility, and. Um, really, we found it's much more difficult to get consistently reliable, trustworthy data when there's not a single person who is actually calling the shots. So that kind of links up all the technical aspects, all the process aspects, and all the data aspects of the register itself. So those are the nine principles that we base registers on when we make them. Like I said, the first one that we like, that we did, we published this one in February 2016. It's the country register the list of countries that the UK recognise, the, the uh, officially recognise. If you go there in your web browser, you'll see a, like, an HTTP front end, an uh, HTML front end, you can click around, you can have a look. There's also an API which reflects it, which we'll talk more about later. And there it is. So here's, here's the data we record about countries. We require the two-letter ISO code, which is quite a common standard for, for country names. There's a few people, like the Olympic Committee, who use the three-letter code. Which, like, well, when you see Olympics on the TV, you'll see like GBR rather than GB for Great Britain, um, or USA for America, or US in the two-letter code. There's the, the name we know it by, like the Gambia. Its official name that it's registered by, like the official Republic, uh, sorry, the Republic of the Gambia. The, the name of the citizens that come from there, Gambians, and then the start date and the end date. So there's a bunch of countries around 1989 and 1990 which ceased to be, like West Germany and East Germany, and a bunch of new countries that came into being, like the Federal Republic of Germany and um, Czechoslovakia and countries like this. So that's how we, we, we denote when they, they, you know, when they change status. And um, the custodian, this guy, Tony Warren, we say who he is, and we tell you what the country code means. So it's the two-letter code from this particular ISO standard. You can go and, go and look that standard up, and then you can understand what that code means. And then you can get a copy of the data, or you can have a look at it, like we just did. So, trust. Trust in the data is a really interesting thing, because you've got this massive data set, which I guess well, you, you guys have been in the open source community before. You've downloaded like uh, CD-ROMs of Linux and this kind of stuff, and you get these, these hashes which tell you that you've got the correct copy of the, of the whole media, like the whole data set. You've downloaded it, you know what the hash is. But that's not enough, because often if you've got uh, a list of all the schools, there's a few thousand schools in the UK, you probably don't care about all of them. You're probably just interested in one of them at a time. Um, so we need to find a way to Im embed trust in, in not only the data set as a whole, but the individual records of the data set. So you can take the individual records without the, without the surrounding bits of data and just use them for whatever purpose it is you have. 
and then we have to, like, like I already mentioned, we have to marry up the, the process side that is going on in real life and the technical side with the facts we're publishing in the actual data that you, you can get through the APIs. Um, so food hygiene rating is a really good example. There's 35,000 food establishments in the UK where you can go, you can buy some food, and the, the Food Standards Agency goes around to all these places periodically and gives them ratings. So this one's got a five. Um, you might choose to eat there if it's got a five. If it's got a two, maybe you'll go somewhere else. Um, but when you're doing that, you don't want to download the entire list of food ratings in the entire country and verify that that's the right data set and then verify that the restaurant you're interested in is in there. What you want to know is, is the one I'm about to go to, is that a, is that a bona fide um, rating or did they just make it up? And it's kind of a straw man, but there's other things you might want to do around um, businesses. So if you had a list of businesses in the UK and you were going to do some, some um, business with one of them, you'd, you'd want to just know the, know the particular facts about the, that particular business that you're doing your due diligence on. Um, and this is, and so Michaela is going to talk you through some of the, how we actually build the tech to actually allow you to, to find out that trust in that, in that way. Try not to move too far. Okay. I don't have a pocket. Oh, I do have a pocket. I'll just leave it there. So, um, so as Andy said, I'm going to talk a bit about the tech, about how we, how we prove things like this, how you would come across this food hygiene rating in your local pub and check that it's a genuine entry in a register without downloading the entire data set onto your phone, which would not be possible. <laughs> Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so we've actually borrowed some of these concepts from, well, the whole concept from a project by Google called Certificate Transparency. Um, and they're using this to um, create sort of a, a log of valid SSL certificates um, to make sure that the, the, it's not a certain certificate hasn't been generated by like a rogue certificate authority. So. Um, I'm going to show you an example. Um, so Certificate of Antitrust and Transparency works on a concept called Merkle Trees, and we've borrowed that, and I'm going to show you an example of how we build one of those up. So this is an example of uh, the, food hygiene's, the food hygiene rating register. So you've got four food hygiene ratings here for four different restaurants. Um, as Andy said, you'd probably go to the tool ship, and you wouldn't go to Prima Donna if you saw these ratings. Um, so we have these four ratings. These are entries in our register. We start off by calculating sort of the cryptographic hash digest of those that, that content, um, which for maybe CD there. Um, we then start building this up into a tree, um, which looks a bit like this. So um, each at each layer, you combine the 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 um, two of the hashes below to create a new one, um, and until you get to the very top, and you've you've got a a hash at the top of the tree called the, the root hash of the Merkle tree. Um, and the, prop, the special thing about this is that if you change, um, if you remove anything from here, if you change any of the content in any of those, um, those that content there, or change the order of any of them, your, your K value at the top will, will change, and you'll know that someone has maybe maliciously changed, changed uh, some of the contents of your register, um, or maybe so um, this is what happens if you then decide to add a new um, entry into the register. You create a new entry for Roy's Rolls. So I've got three star. Um, and you build up your tree. Um, what's special about some of the properties of this tree is that it allows you to, um, you can tell quite easily without downloading the whole register using certain nodes in this tree that um, that nothing, since downloading the register last, say if you download the first four and you then later download the next one for Roy's, Roy, uh, Roy's roles, um, that the first four haven't been changed. Um, and that's because um, of the way this tree is built up. So, um, and at the end, you'll probably sign that to prove that I, Mr. 
person in the food standards uh, agency can verify that this I, I built up this register of food standards agencies. Um, going back to the country register, this is an example of just what the data in the country register looks like. This is the raw data, a very simplified version. Um, so these are just blobs of JSON. Each one of these describes a country. Um, the structure of this piece of JSON de varies depending on the register you're looking at. The um, key value pairs are sort of fields and uh, fields in the register and the value for that field. Um, the different colors here just represent that these are three different countries. Um, and we call these items. Um, we have a, bit, a very specific data model in registers that allow us to build up this integrity and build our, the cryptography into our model. Um, so we have quite specific terminology and these are items and these describe sort of the domain specific data in a register. To append this to a register, we add entries and each entry has an item corresponding to it and it's referenced again by the, the digest of that item. Um, and each entry is more, more the metadata around when that item was added to a register. So you have a timestamp as to when it was added to a register and it has a key. Um, now, if I was going to say something that changed recently in the country register versus that we changed the name of, or Tony Warren changed the name of the Czech Republic to Czechia. Um, that was in the news apparently, but um, some people didn't see it. Um, but we got that update in the register. So if you're going to do that update, um, you append a new entry against CZ, which is the key for the previous version of CZ. Um, and that is how you change Czech Republic to Czechia. You, you, it's always append only. The, the entry log describes the append only nature of a register. So you can see that at some point, CZ referenced Czech Republic, but now it's Czechia. So I can give you, okay, so yeah. So the next step in this is, so you can see at the bottom, we might say, if this is a um, list of uh, events in the register, you might put something at the end that says sort of assert that the root hash of this register is this. So if someone takes this as a file, um, they can consume all of that and they can appropriately calculate that that's a valid root hash for that data and that no one's changed it. If they don't see a root hash, you might worry that, where has this come from? Um, so something else that's important in uh, registers is strong metadata. That's a list of countries, but or is it a list of countries about? What does that list of countries mean? So um, going back to some of the characteristics, um, there's um, only a one register for a specific type of thing, so it might exist for a specific reason. It has a clear reason to exist, like legislation. So the register of countries is actually being given a title by, uh, the, by Tony Warren, and he has said that this is the British English language names and descriptive terms for countries. Um, but at the moment, I could just give you this list and give you this and just tell you what that's what it is, and that's effectively what we do at the moment. But someone else could take the same list and tell you, actually, this is the list of countries in which UK citizens can legally marry. I mean, I couldn't think of a very good example as to why I would maliciously want to do that. But um, you might do. You might decide that I want to get married somewhere where the UK actually wouldn't re recognise it. Um, and there's no way of knowing whether or not this is a lie. So at the moment, we're, we're now, think, we're now, things we're now realizing is that, so you, yeah, this root hash doesn't, even with this root hash, you can be told that that's what that means. So what we're now doing is putting strong metadata into the entry log of the register. So, um, and naturally, because it's in the entry log and the, um, that falls into the Merkle tree structure, you're root hash will take into account the metadata for that register as well. So it's meaning. So other than, as well as the meaning for the register, things like the meaning of a field in a register, we're also doing things like that. The, the data type for a field in its register, this is all metadata that we want to be, we want to allow people to prove that that's the intention of the custodian. At the time that this was minted in the register, this was what it meant. Um, and this is basically what this whole file format brings us to is something called register serialization format. So the idea is that, um, I'll come to it in a minute, but we've got a software implementation of an API on top of it, which makes it more easy to consume for our users. But ultimately, 
if that's not around, you've got register serialization format, which is a, um, a, a, a is, it describes the whole register without any software around it. And this can last for a very long time. And anyone can look at it, and it has exactly the same integrity as it would if it were provided via an API. Um, it's, yeah. So, um, so as I said, that's, Entry log is quite complex. Um, people probably, most people, most users in government especially will not mind so much that um, um, they will, well, they will not want that entire entry log. So we've got an API on top of this that provides some, some methods on top of it to make it easier to consume. Um, at GDS, we think a lot about our users. We have stickers that say users first. It's nice. We get, Andy doesn't have them on his laptop, but most people do. Um, so here's a one of the, another repeat of the, one of the characteristics. So as we said, it's a usable list of data, so usable. Um, so we've got our append-only list of entries. Most people don't mind about the entire history of updates, and they probably just want the latest thing. So our API provides sort of an index on top of this, and we call it records. And the set of records is just the latest entry for a key value. And that changes over time as entries come in for the same primary key. It, that, that list updates itself. The entry log is always append only and never, never has anything changed that was already there. Um, the idea of index is that it's the data you want by the key you want to use, because you might want to ask different questions based on a different key in the register, um, cut into usable groups. Um, so if you're the Olympic committee, you might decide that actually some, then we might provide an index of country by ISO 3 code or something, and that this is all the different ways that you might index the register. So that's what our API does. Um, we have a specification for it open. We're, we're building it as we build out the API. Um, I continue for a bit. Right. Um, so one other challenging property of registers, or interesting property, is that they're distributed. They're linked to each other, as Andy said. Um, they're minimum, and they link to each other because if you're... Um, the, the custodian for the school register, you want to, you're not an authority on details of a local authority and its boundary, so you will link to the local authority register for that. Um, but they're distributed because government is quite distributed in itself. It has different departments. Citizens aren't supposed to be able to tell that it is, but it is. Um, so we've got this property that they link to each other. They don't duplicate data. They reuse each other by linking to each other via some kind of key. Um, so data dissipates around a system in three ways. We've got distribution, replication, and duplication. Um, I've kind of got a few diagrams to describe this. So we're, we're aiming to allow for the first two, but not for the bottom one. We're, that's a problem we're aiming to solve with this project. So this is a diagram of a sort of the standard centralized uh, architecture. It works for most services in government, but for data, it just causes lots of duplicate copies to be stored on local systems around and people to change their own versions, so we're not doing that. This is a distributed architecture, so this is what we're allowing for. So you've got, you've got idle for too long. <laughs> so um, country, school and local authority, we've already said that they will be um, custodians by different people, different departments. They'll probably also be hosted in different places and behind, maybe signed by different people, obviously, but um, they might be hosted in different places because um, government IT departments are quite, they like to keep things where they are. So we need to allow for that. We need them to link to each other, be hosted in completely different places. Um, but data being data, you still need to allow for people to take copies of it, but know it's the same thing, whether that's to run their service, they want to replicate it locally, so for their, their own reasons for running their own service, maybe they want to just take three out of, registers out of an ecosystem of thousands and host their own and just take copy, replicate it. Um, this is uh, the duplicated sort of diagram which we're trying to avoid and trying to solve. So you've got three copies of the country register, each hosted by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, Her Majesty's uh, Revenue and Customs and Her Majesty's Passport Office, lots of acronyms in government. Um, so this is what we're trying to avoid. We don't want this to happen. We want them to reuse 
data where the authority is. So registers need to link to each other. Um, this, um, so as I said, school and local authority, school might have reference local authority and local authority might reference country. And what we're now looking at is, as well as having really strong metadata about the meaning of a single register, is how do you also cryptographically prove the link in, the links between registers. I can give you, um, I can give you a school register that links to, and that can be cryptographically proven, all the meaning behind that, what the um, description of that is, what the description of the fields are, what the data types are, but it links to a local authority register, and I can just replace that local authority register with a different local authority register, which has different boundaries, and you, you, you suddenly your school is in a different local authority boundary and you wouldn't know. So we're now looking at how to, or thinking about how to apply our cryptographic verification and proofs to registers that link to each other to allow for this distributed nature of government data without duplicating it. So um, this is it really, um, to summarize, um, in increasing, uh, sorry, in decreasing longevity, you've got the data which will be around for a very, very long time. As Andy said, the land registry has been around for hundreds of years. Um, the data model will be around for a long time. Um, this is the thing that provides integrity. So even if our software implementation is an API, um, or our whole team, which we might all disappear and go and work on something else and not get replaced, um, the data model is still there with the signatures that say who had vouched for this at a certain point of time and you can still use that later down the line and say this was true at a certain point. Um, we're kind of allowing for certain things to evolve within the data model more than others like um, cryptographic algorithms. Some might become less secure as time goes but we'll still keep most of the model. The APIs are reasonably have a long amount of longevity. Um, we're building a stand, hoping to build a standard where we won't be the only software implementation of it. There will be other reference implementations of the API that's not built within central government. That might be built by other departments, but we will still, hopefully, the whole ecosystem allows the whole ecosystem to work together. And then, lastly, the software implementations. That's probably the last thing to the first thing to go. But um, so that's it. Um, one more thing. Hmm. Oh yeah, go on, say your statement about fish and wine. The old um, data, software matures like fish and data matures like wine. So, mm -hmm. But you want to keep the data around for as long as possible to be able to re replace the software that, that is delivering it and processing it. Um, and then one more thing, we were working in open. Um, this is our GitHub repo. Um, the API and the platform are written in Java, open register Java. Uh, or the first one of many reference implementations is written in Java. Um, that's it. Uh.